in this West Wing Companion, we talked with a prosecutor who sought an intellectual and cultural understanding of justice on the other side of the world, and another who sought justice to try to prevent an imminent bloodbath just a few miles away. Let's start with Scott Sway, who was 14 when he flew to America from Taiwan with his family. Barely speaking English, he settled into life as a grocer's son in the East Bay. About 36 years later, Scott, who is now an assistant district attorney in our office, found himself flying to China as kind of a criminal justice diplomat. While there, he lectured about American justice to Chinese police officers, learned about the history of the vast country's unique systems of justice, toured ancient water towns, and learned from a police officer the bewildering Mandarin title of the Born Identity. Welcome, Scott. Good morning. Thank you for having me. What's the main difference, if you could tell me in sort of a basic way, what's the main difference between the Chinese system of criminal justice and the American criminal justice system that you work in? Good question. Probably can write a book on this, but the big difference is that we're in an adversarial system that we're so used to, we take it for granted. We, we see it, defense attorneys are represented by defense attorneys. The, our justice system is a result of a, almost a, a, a competition, a combat between the defense and the prosecution, and ultimately uh, 12 people in the jury will make a call for the community. Now in China, it's, uh, it's more centralized, where the investigation process like then flow into the prosecution process, the judicial process, or it's a repetition, repetition of investigation. So, so a, a single body will go through all the evidence and make a determination whether or not an accused person is guilty of a crime. So they don't have like sort of the classic defense attorney advocating for the defendant and the prosecutor advocating for the people. It's less of a, of a, of a like you said, a competition. Well, Sean, they actually do, but not in the way that we see it. Their roles are they're not as expansive as in our system. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, their role, um, I think part of it is, is also westernized a little bit, but not to the degree that we're experiencing. What's the Chinese <coughs> perception of law enforcement? By Chinese perception, I mean maybe the average citizen's perception of law enforcement. Is it different than what Americans might think of our system? Yes, I, because I still do think that the Chinese, even though communist uh, revolution has changed a lot of the culture there, but I think still, uh, fundamentally, they still feel like the government officials, such as the police, uh, trickle down to the police, is they're appointed by the, by, by the leader. In the old days, it would be the, the emperor. And the emperor was, was the son of heaven. So, so, so for, for, for these officials, they carry some kind of a special power. If, if my neighbors cannot understand my innocence in this, you should understand because you are appointed by, the, by, by, by a higher power to, to judge me. So, th so there are some certain expectations they have, and uh, also respect that they have for, for that uh, uh, kind of a government entity that I think it's not part of the American culture. So Jeff Rosen would be the son of heaven in our system. Sure, he'll be the, he would be, he'll be appointed by the son of heaven to, nice. to, to govern all of us, and he should know things that we don't know. <laughs> he does. <laughs> is there a lot of crime in China? Is there, and, and if there is, or what type of crime is there? Is it different than what you see here in America? It's interesting. When I toured their crime lab, and I asked them what is the, uh, what their DNA technology, what kind of crime do they use to so, uh, use DNA to solve? They say, well, the, the big thing is uh, um, burglaries. burglaries. So a lot of property crimes over there, um, but also, there, there, there are crimes over there that would probably, you know, in a, in a system where it's somewhat totalitarian, you, they may quant quantify or describe certain things as crimes, but for us, it would be, oh, just some guy walking down the street saying something about the government, you know? So, um, so it's kind of hard to, to, to have a fair comparison because what we call crimes here and what they call crimes there, it's not always the same. A lot of stuff is the same, you know, murders and rape and things like that. But, but there's some nuanced stuff that, that it's kind of hard to quantify. Speaking of nuance, did your trip change your perception of China at all? Uh, it did. I, um, although I'm of a Chinese descent, I um, was not very familiar with China other than from what I read. You know, going over there, I read a lot of, I, I saw a lot of things there that really gave me a very good perspective, uh, uh, good 
just a different perspective on how we see China and how they see us in many ways. So I thought uh, it is true that you can, you can read as much about a place that you're interested in, but by going there and walking around and talking to people, um, it really gave me a, a different, a deeper, deeper understanding of, of, of what's, what's going on in China. What do they think of our justice system, for instance? Do they have any perceptions about how we do things over here in courts? I, I think for the most part, they know very little about what we do here. <clears throat> I think they, they do see us as a, a capitalistic country. And, and I think they, they make the assumptions, probably analogous assumptions about us as we do about them being a communist country. You know, we're a country that excelled um, in our own right, and they feel like they're also, um, they also excel in, in a, uh, at least not the kind of democracy that, that we are, but they feel like, hey, we can be just as successful uh, moving within 50 years from probably one of the poorest countries in the world to the second biggest economy. So they are very proud of that, and they, that's, to me, they, they feel like that's vindication to them that the American way isn't the only way to succeed in this world. All right, now, toughest question. What is the Chinese title of the born identity? <laughs> well, I don't, I, okay. It's, as you know, you know, we, we talked about this a little bit, Sean, that, that when the American movies gets uh, taken over to China, they, they, they put a different title on there because the culture is different. They, they're trying to, it's marketing. So they're trying to put a title a title, certain words in there that will make people want to go see the movie. So born identity actually really has very little meaning if you translate it to Chinese, it's just somebody's last name, identity. So what they did was they made it, I don't remember now, some kind of a, you know, ghost identity or something that, um, but when, when, the, when I was talking to the, to the Chinese about the movie, they was, oh, we love this movie, this is the movie, and they say it in Chinese, and I was thinking, I've never heard of that movie before, you know? So we, we spent a lot of time figuring, oh, that's James Bond. Okay, I get it now. So, so it's very interesting. That's an interesting question that you asked me because there was a lot of these little, little cultural gaps that, that when we spoke, and we, we thought we were speaking about one thing, but it's actually something entirely different. Great trip, though, huh? It, it was a great trip, and uh, I thank the district attorney for allowing me to go. Hopefully, my talks over there has, uh, um, you know, tr trigger something in them as well, and I, I hope that they, they, we will have uh, better, ex more exchanges like that in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. I'd like to welcome Deputy District Attorney Chris Walsh, whose work in the middle of one night with the Campbell Police Department may have prevented a terrible tragedy. Set this up, Chris. What were you doing that night? Well, I was sleeping, uh, <laughs> is what I was doing before I got a phone call. And uh, I was on a uh, search warrant or on call duty. And being on that sort of assignment is very unpredictable. Uh, but you basically have to make sure that your phone is turned on and that if you get a phone call in the middle of the night, you answer the call. And what essentially calls, that's what I did. What type of calls would you get, you know, the range? Sure. It could be anything from uh, a homicide that took place, an officer involved shooting that took place, uh, or an in-progress uh, crime that detectives were uh, needed some kind of quick response on. So this particular case, set it up for me, tell me what it was. Sure. So I got a call from a detective from Campbell PD, mm -hmm. and they essentially, they said, we have what we believe was a potential mass shooting that was about to happen. Um, haven't gotten a lot of phone calls like that. No. This was definitely unusual. And uh, the detective basically gave me some information um, and uh, told me they had received a phone call from uh, the ex-wife of the suspect who had alerted the police that she believed she was scared because she thought there might actually be a mass shooting right. based upon some text messages she had received from her ex. Uh, the police responded to that. And when I got the phone call, they had um, just detained the suspect, mm -hmm. and they had his place of work uh, kind of a, a surrounded by police officers, and they wanted to get into that place of business because they believed there were uh, essentially an arsenal, uh, a bunch of weapons. So you threw on some clothes, and what did you do? Um, I basically uh, spoke with the detective. We went through uh, the search warrant he had proposed where he laid out all of the reasons why 
the police had probable cause to go into that business, why they believed there was a mass shooting, why they needed to seize these weapons. Um, I read through some of the stuff, uh, critiqued it, we made some changes to it, and then the detectives, not myself, <laughs> went inside the business uh, and located a ton of weapons there. Did you have a sense of urgency that night? Did you have a sense of like almost, you know, it's almost like an episode of 24 or one of those sort of thriller shows, like, you know, in real time. It's all, absolutely. So it's already kind of a different feeling when you're woken up in the middle of the night and there's a phone call, like, what is this emergency going on that, you know, we need to try to stop something. But in particular, when you're talking about a mass shooting, and at that time, um, it had not been very long since there had been some horrible mass shootings. So it was kind of in the back of my mind. You hear about that stuff on the news, but then it was, it was scary to get a phone call like that and realize there could have been something like that that close to home. And they found a lot of weapons. Really an arsenal and some really high-powered rifles with scopes on them, uh, an AR-15. And when they got to the business, uh, not only did they have those text messages where it looked like he was really planning on doing this, but then when they actually went, got the search warrant and went inside the business, all of these guns were out of the gun safe, kind of set up there as if something was really about to happen. Oh my gosh. When it's all said and done and you finish that night being on call, did you have a sense of accomplishment? Did you have a sense of like what could have been and, and what didn't happen? I really did. And I think in terms of just because we hear about so many horrible things on the news and to see something like this where I was thinking, you know what, tomorrow morning, people in our community aren't going to wake up to just something horrible that happened last night. And maybe most people would never know, you know, that this didn't, you know, was avoided or was so close to happening. Uh, but it was a wonderful feeling to realize that, you know what, this is a success story in the sense that we stopped a horrible thing before it happened. Some people, maybe people who watch a little bit too much TV, um, might think that prosecutors simply show up in court real defendants until they confess, right, <laughs> on the stand. But your role that night and other prosecutors' roles um, are sometimes to work hand-in-hand -hand with law enforcement in real time to prevent crime from happening or to deal with crime as it's happening, right? Right, and that is a big part of what we do that probably isn't as obvious to most people. It isn't just a 30-minute Law & Order episode going into court, getting that conviction. Uh, a lot of times it is working together with detectives to make sure we're following the law and doing the right process uh, and giving real-time advice uh, in the middle of the night at times. Wow. Must be very satisfying. That was in particular a very satisfying, uh, just to be a part of it. And obviously the detectives, Campbell PD, really responded fast and they deserve the credit for uh, this not happening. But it was a special feeling to be a small part of that. Thank you. Thank you for your service.